Well, we are happy to have in Medils here first our friend, but also a famous uh, uh, doctor, population geneticist, uh, specialist of global health. And uh, Igor, we welcome here. Thank you. Uh, many, many times. Uh, I just wish to leave a trace of, of, of our meeting uh, after that many years. So welcome and tell, tell me what is different since four years when you were here. Uh, thank you, what? thank you, Miro and Danica. Beautiful people, beautiful place, medals. And I remember I was here, I think, in January uh, 2020, just before the pandemic, and uh, we were uh, listening to wonderful music of your Parisian friends, Le Gitan Ivanovich. Ivanovich, Ivanovich right? Yeah. Yes. The yes, gypsies, beautiful, yes. beautiful experience. Phenomenal. It was in this space. It actually. was in this yes, space, yes, phenomenally yes. sophisticated yes. experience. I still recall it as the last thing I remember before the pandemic yes. started. So, um, uh, yes, it's wonderful being here again after, after those uh, two and a half strange, strange and weird uh, years. And it's wonderful to see how science... Uh, has helped us during this two and a half years to firstly understand what's happening, then to find the answers, then to find drugs that we already had that could help, then to uh, develop vaccines, then to develop completely new drugs that can help. And now we are in a slightly safer uh, situation than we were back then. And uh, it's just wonderful being here again with, with good friends. And, uh, you know, these two and a half years have been exhausting. Uh, I have been leading a Center for Global Health at the University of Edinburgh. It's one of the top 20 in the world. Uh, my workload has quadrupled, I would say. Wow. So, and uh, it was very difficult to decide what to do. Should we talk to... Uh, journalists, if you start talking to journalists, you have 200 uh, invitations immediately, very quickly. Yeah. Uh, should we uh, publish results from all over the world? We, I was leading Journal of Global Health. Uh, the new impact factor is now 7.66. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the reason uh, is because uh, we were the main place where people from low and middle income countries were publishing their uh, pandemic mm -hmm. experiences. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, do you do research? Because in, in Scotland, we had Eve2 group who um, uh, put together and digitalized all the health records about the pandemic, wow. about the vaccines. And now we had probably about 10, 15 Lancet papers just in the last uh, year. And uh, um, there's been a tectonic change. Those journals that were publishing about pandemics went up and the others went... Uh, down. So, uh, you know, we had to do research, we had to also reorganize teaching, we had to worry about all our students who were from countries, do they stay, do they go? It was crazy, crazy two and a half years. And all this time we were advising governments, we were advising several governments all over the world, and it was just a completely hectic time. And it was very interesting too, because we thought that science knows all the answers, but speaking to governments, we realized you know, we can tell them what we think is the best, but they can say, yes, that's great, but, you know, we also have money to worry about, we also have security and safety uh, situation to worry about, and this is just a health problem, so we have to take everything into account. And every government did completely different uh, uh, things uh, based on exactly the same advice from the scientists. So this was very interesting for us uh, to learn. So that's, that's how yeah. two and a half years just went by like this. Yeah. Uh, it was crazy busy, but uh, today we are here for a completely different reason. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. right. so I'm sorry, I hope I haven't been too long. No, no uh, ne ne uh, never. It's, it's always, always going to be too short. During that time, Danisa arranged this place as a salon for art and science, something, you know, uh, 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 luxurious in a way. Uh, and also, we were privileged in a, in, a, in a strange way to be uh, 
physically isolated. This is a you know place isolated from the from split, and split is isolated from the world in a way. All right, but I would like to ask you one question uh, in in relation to to the pandemic, and that is, what is your personal opinion? Uh, what happened while science and government were science and power came so closely. Uh, who went into who into whom in a way <coughs> did uh, did science enter power, which would make sense as at least in terms of advising, or did did you notice? So, what is your your opinion about that, or? Did power enter into science and did some damage? Oh, uh, that's a good question, isn't it? <laughs> well, I, I think for, for uh, you know, uh, I had quite a lot, personally, I had quite a lot of experience with uh, uh, advising governments mm. in global health because I was going to many governments uh, before in Africa, in South America, in Southeast Asia, advising them on how to reduce child mortality. So that seems like mm. a very noble goal, you know, you want to reduce right. child mortality, but then you realize you come there with scientific advice and every government re responds completely differently. Right. Yeah. So I learned early on, uh, uh, actually that, that was maybe my advantage in comparison to many other scientists who entered this pandemic. My advantage, uh, advantage was that I realized that uh, uh, as an advisor, your role only goes that far. You can say, look, you can do this and this will happen. You can do this, this will happen. You can do this, this will happen. That's all you can do. You cannot tell the government what to do. If you start doing that, you will <laughs> make a very powerful enemy. So you always need to stay within your borders and say, uh, this is what's going to happen. And then some governments would say, okay, we will follow science. We trust you because we don't know anything about this. But some governments will bluntly tell you, uh, I had that experience, they will say, look, this is how the situation is for us. Uh, we could listen to you and then we'll save some old people who are sick. But as a result, we will have young people rioting in the streets because they cannot go and work. You have countries like Peru, where 70% of people live off a gray economy zone, yeah, right? right. So, they will not respect any idea of uh, uh, some epidemiological measures and so on, and the government will have riots. So what is the government going to do? And then the government does not have money to uh, pay those people while they are uh, staying at home. So if they start paying them, they will just bankrupt. So they tell you in the face, look, I have three options, bankruptcy of this country after which I fall, or riots in the streets of young people yeah. after which I am in trouble and danger, or letting many old sick people, you know, uh, meet their fate, after which, you know, even our pensions fund is going to be a bit relieved and so on, and there's not going to be anyone shouting at us for not protecting them, because they are so few, actually. I mean, uh, they are totally massive millions numbers, but in the population it's still less than 1% and nobody will notice that they're not here anymore. So it's, it's been an incredible experience for many scientists because they always thought that this whole pandemic is a question of science and this is a research question that can be solved through science and there is only one solution. And then they realize that very quickly this solution uh, which they thought was only one, uh, <laughs> got an ideological perspective to it very quickly and security perspective and economic perspective and it suddenly became very muddled and there were many solutions and none of them uh, were necessarily entirely scientific, right? So uh, what many learned the hard way, the scientists here, is that they are scientists and they are not politicians, they are not in power, and that uh, if, if they tried too hard to push for their uh, arguments, uh, they met fierce resistance and got themselves into quite a bit of trouble. 
So um, some then realized this and backed off, some uh, fought even uh, harder. And then in every country you got the different mix of experiences and the different uh, result. So it's interesting, you know, there, there's a whole spectrum now from, from China being the most uh, rigorously following the mm. advice of scientists to, I don't know, I mean, Peru was probably unfortunate and the whole Eastern Europe uh, was, was uh, uh, not really after uh, initial first wave uh, following that much advice of science. They, they, they were led by other uh, uh, criteria. So, so there's going to be so much to study and learn about uh, fr from this pandemic, not just about mm -hmm. science. Uh, science did really well in this pandemic. Uh, um, no matter what public opinion thinks of them, they did fantastically well to deliver vaccines, to deliver drugs, to study, they all organized. But there's so much to learn about the society and the next problem that we're going to be facing, be it a global warming, be it oceans, uh, be it energy crisis and so on, we're, we're going to be seeing these same uh, problems and cultural wars. So, you know, being a scientist, giving a scientific advice is one thing. Entering a cultural war <laughs> is a completely yeah. different thing. And, you know, uh, you could see that I gave advice and health promotion early on, just thinking that that's required for, for the population to understand what's happening. But very soon I backed out of media uh, because I did not want to be part of some cultural wars. That, mm. that, that There's not ever going to be a winner in this war. People are now completely divided everywhere. And, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, many scientists got themselves in a lot of trouble. So, you know, it's, it's very important, I think, for scientists to understand that there is only so much they can do as scientists. If they want to do more, they have to become activists and politicians, but not, that, that, that's not, not scientists who think they can talk to other groups in the society. That's, that's not a good role for them, I think. What do you say about <laughs> a, what do you say heavy, about the cases heavy, like heavy uh, like Didier Raoul in 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 Marseille, where uh, he couldn't serve as the wisdom of science advising the French government, but the French government turned on 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 him, uh, and 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 that was in in France and. Uh, a, a particular situation where the question was now what happens to to scientists what happens to those that uh, like to ask too many questions and 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 how much how much did this pressure which could introduce in scientists fear that they may lose their career like Didier Raoul just lost or could get even corrupted, you know, you know, mm -hmm. join us mm -hmm. and, and you'll have some, some kudos for, for mm -hmm. that. Uh, and do you think that this happened in any way to, to, to in, in, in England, uh, in France, people are divided mm -hmm. uh, about, mm -hmm. ab about mm -hmm. that. But uh, is there a consensus in England uh, about this, this issue, how much did uh, uh, power require from scientists just to give their scientific blessing for them to do what they want to do? Mm. That, that is, that is uh, a really, really another heavy and uh, difficult uh, question. So, you know, scientists uh, are in science because they want to improve the world, they want to, yes. to make the world a better place. So once the pandemic struck, there were many of them who just thought, oh, this is now the time where I can really yeah. uh, do something. Yes. And uh, whoever was invited by any government in the world to, to advise, immediately say yes, you know, they, they th thought this was a fantastic opportunity, yeah. being very naive to what this could lead to. That's, this could lead to suddenly them being uh, potentially responsible for parts of the, uh, of the mm. actions of the government. And, and, and then, you know, um, uh, they would, if, if they did not like what happened, mm. they would either have to say, look, we completely disagree. This is not what our advice was, in which case there's going to be a big yes. problem. Yeah. Or they could say, um, uh, they could just keep quiet and uh, then they could potentially later be 
uh, held liable for any loss of uh, life or, right, or wrong right, decisions. Right. So they only later realized that, uh, you know, they were very eager to, to, to join and to, to help. But then they realized, oh my goodness, this is not the it situation was, where we ever find ourselves. We have yeah, our rules of communication, was, we have our rules of uh, reporting and, and expressing ourselves. Yeah. And it's always a very okay. safe environment. We, you know, whoever doesn't respect our science rules is very quickly right. left out. This has been a completely new situation and many have found themselves in a very difficult territory. And some made decisions uh, based on their... Uh, you know, best judgment, some made based on their fear or uh, some made based on their willingness to be recognized or, or, or in the media. So there, th th this showed many characteristics of people, uh, of the scientists as, as people, you know, uh, uh, they, they did very different things in different countries based on their own uh, uh, judgment yeah, the and different cultures came absolutely to, to express everything yeah. and, and personalities mm. and cultures mm. everything so it's been a very testing time for science and i think scientists need to reflect on this time and and the really think hard what is the best way to give uh, advice without getting into so much yes, uh, yes. trouble uh, and heat uh, yeah. from the public we, we just uh, eager we just touched the question and but we'll We'll make a pause until you are here ne next time. Um, whether, you know, saying knowledge is power, science is power, how did that play in, in these last two and a half years? Um, some people feel that, oh, you can conclude, oh, no, power, knowledge is not power. Power is power and science is science. Uh, about that, we'll continue probably uh, when, <laughs> when, we, when we know better, when others have also reflected on this. And uh, right now, we'll move to the other part of, uh, of uh, Medils. And just to repeat once again, what a pleasure to, to, to have you. Uh, How privileged we would be if, uh, if you spent uh, more time here, uh, then we would have uh, uh, the occasion to, to spread this discussion uh, uh, longer than uh, this young man could be filming us. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, Mira, Mira, I absolutely, absolutely plan to. This has delayed me for two and a half years, this pandemic, but I always had plans to contribute and to help and to support medals. And uh, I'm sorry that uh, the pandemic has completely uh, stole two and a half years of my life. But now I feel uh, that there is a big opportunity to continue where we, where we stop. Thank yes. you very much, dear no, no problem. Igor, dear friend. You are always at home here in Medils. Thank you uh, very, very much. Right. That's, yes. that's how I feel here. That's, Just that's give, how. give me some respect, please. Give me some respect. <laughs> <laughs>